but it is my pleasure to introduce the next session on creative responses to the security risks of the rising seas. And it's an especial privilege to be back at my alma mater. Um, but looking at the RSVP list in person on, a, on the live stream, I want to acknowledge the service of the active duty officers and leaders joining us today from the Navy, the Coast Guard, Air Force, and the Army, if Colonel Wilkerson is still here. Also, civilian leaders from the cities of Norfolk, Hampton Roads, Newport News, Portsmouth, Williamsburg, Yorktown. Your presence here and leadership on the issue is vital to moving forward on unprecedented risks to the region. Finally, the William & Mary Board of Visitors and Office of the President are represented, and I'm just thrilled that my alma mater is convening on this vital issue. I'm partly here as an alumnus of the college and partly as executive director of the David Rockefeller Fund, but mostly as a concerned East Coast citizen who has been looking at the security impacts of climate change for almost 10 years. At the David Rockefeller Fund, we seek bipartisan solutions to climate change, and we believe national and homeland security impacts have the highest potential to unite lawmakers and policymakers of good faith behind common sense solutions to the basic science and security challenges of global climate change. I want to begin with a quote from the draft summary for policymakers of the special report on global warming for one and a half degrees Celsius sent to governments by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and currently under review until the end of this month. Quote, there are substantial increases in extremes between the present day and a global warming of one and a half degrees Celsius and between one and a half degrees and two degrees, including hot extremes in all inhabited regions of the world, heavy precipitation events in most regions, and extreme droughts in some regions, unquote. This was expressed with, quote, high confidence, the term of art for global scientific community consensus of the highest confidence. Accelerating sea level rise, primarily driven by climate change, is projected to worsen tidal flooding in the U.S. and put at least 300,000 coastal homes in the lower 48 states at risk with a collective market value of over $100 billion. I don't have to tell many of you in the audience, including our panelists, that Virginia coastal real estate is especially exposed to such risks. And in prepping for this conference, I was saddened to read that more than 3,000 homes in the Hampton Roads area alone are at risk. In Portsmouth and Hampton, more than half of residents are African American, and this country's history of natural disasters makes clear that elderly and marginalized households typically have fewer resources available for coping with challenges like flooding. This is also true for other climate change exacerbated emergencies, like an increase in heat waves and the risk of heat-related illnesses and deaths, which took dozens of lives in Quebec just last week. And such risks are growing in Virginia. Adding to public health concerns, saltwater intrusion on local aquifers will endanger drinking water. <clears throat> These risks to people's basic security and health is a concern of the David Rockefeller Fund at one end of the spectrum, but the late David Rockefeller was also a veteran who served with General George Marshall in Europe and spent most of his life building a bipartisan consensus about national security priorities as longtime chair and through his endowment of the Council on Foreign Relations. And that is why we have long been concerned about the threats to the densest collection of military facilities in the nation where the hard work of adaptation has barely begun. A 2014 study by the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center identified, quote, tipping point, a, a tipping point for the bases near Norfolk, after which, quote, the probabilities of damage to infrastructure and losses in mission performance increased dramatically, unquote. And Admiral Titley keeps reminding the media and the public that there is almost no action plan to address the sea level rise on our shores or the storm, storm surge, which scientists expect uh, to, ex to, to grow within, within just a few decades. Even a 2013 state commission report here projected one and a half feet of sea level rise within 20 to 50 years. But climate change also poses risks to half of all U.S. military bases worldwide. That's because, as Dr. Gong and Admiral Titley explained, the links between Arctic sea and land ice melt the geophysical architecture of our world is changing, and we are moving way too slowly to mitigate the risks. 
So to return to our original concern, it's not just the military bases and facilities that need creative responses, it will also be the neighborhoods immediately surrounding them. We have some of the most knowledgeable experts in the nation with us here. So to discuss creative responses, let me introduce our panelists. We are very fortunate, just to my right, to be joined by retired Navy Rear Admiral Ann Phillips, who is one of the most informed and experienced military leaders in the nation on these topics. From 2009 to 12, she served on the Chief of Naval Operations Climate Change Task Force and Energy Task Force, where she developed and implemented climate change adaptation and energy re reduction strategies for the Navy. Then after 31 years of active duty, she came here to William & Mary's Mason Business School and graduated with distinction in 2016. We are joined just to her right by, as you know, the Honorable John Conger, who did not say this morning that he was recently in federal service as Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Defense or Comptroller at the U.S. Department of Defense. In various roles at the Pentagon, John oversaw a vast portfolio that included, among other things, base closure, energy security, climate change, and management of $850 billion in real property. John also has vast experience in Congress, including as professional staff for the House International Relations Committee. Finally, it is my privilege to introduce the panel's chair to the right of John, Elizabeth Andrews, professor of the practice of law and director of William & Mary Law School's Virginia Coastal Policy Center. Professor Andrews was destined for great things as a graduate of this college, and most recently she served as the water policy manager for the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality where she worked closely with the legislature and environmental organizations to address the water quality and quantity challenges facing Virginia, particularly its coastal areas. Areas. She also serves as a Virginia representative on the Chesapeake Bay Program's Climate Resiliency work, work Group. So without further ado, thank you for your interest and attention today, and I'll turn it over to Professor Andrews. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is this on? Testing, testing, is this on? All right. Um, so to set the stage, um, we're going to hear from each of our distinguished speakers in a moment. They're going to speak for a few minutes, and then I'm going to ask them a few questions, and then I'm going to open it up to you all for questions and comments. So take notes and be prepared and ask some good questions, because it's not often we have this much uh, institutional knowledge here together with us. Just to set the stage um, about what are these rising seas that we're talking about? Um, I'm going to quote Dr. Gong from just this morning when he said, um, the prediction of Arctic sea ice is hard and still not very good. And sea level rise in general is a hard thing to predict. Um, both NOAA and the Corps of Engineers have projections that range from low to high. Um, and we're very lucky here in Virginia. We have data from the Sewell's Point tide gauge that's been tracking it since the 1920s, projections tend to shift as the data improves and as the factors shift. So, for example, in 2013, we had a, um, an important study that was produced for the General Assembly called the Recurrent Flooding Study for Tidewater Virginia, produced by VIMS. Uh, Kirk Havens is hiding back there. And uh, ODU, Larry Atkinson, is hiding back there as well and helped produce the data that called for a high sea level rise scenario of a 2.2 foot rise from 1992 to 2066. VIMS recently developed a range of projections based on NOAA data for sea level rise in Virginia, and they compensated for land subsidence. And um, keep in mind, there's six different sea level rise scenarios that were developed in this NOAA report that they produced in January 2017. So for 2060, the low climate change scenario under, under that projection would be 1.1 foot increase in mean sea level rise over the 1970 baseline. And the intermediate scenario would be a two-foot rise, and extreme would be 3.4 feet. So we're constantly tweaking and shifting as we get better data and as the scenario shifts. Um, the Union of Concerned Scientists report that recently came out, they also looked at the NOAA low, medium, and high scenarios from their 2014 report. And for a high, they project that Hampton Roads would have a 7.2-foot increase over 1992 levels by 2100 which would mean a total market value of the homes that would chronically flood at that point would be more than $5 billion today, a significant impact, as you can tell. So lesson number one is that um, we have to constantly remember it's not a, a pinpoint number, it's a range, and it's constantly being improved and updated. The second thing is that the rate of sea level rise is increasing 
at an accelerating rate. So it's not constant. In Hampton Roads, it took about 25 years, according to that NOAA 2017 report, about 25 years for the sea to rise five and a half inches, and it's expected to rise by the same amount over the next 12 years. So the rate is increasing too, an accelerating rate. And then a final example is that NOAA just produced their 2017 State of the U.S. High Tide Flooding and it, with a tw 2018 outlook. And they noted that nationwide, the average annual frequency of high tide flooding was six flood days in 2017, a new record. And breaking that record is expected to continue for decades to come because of sea level rise. And due to sea level rise, the national average frequency of high tide flooding is double what it was 30 years ago. So. As um, Josh noted earlier, public education is key. People need to realize what a significant problem this is, and it's an increasingly important problem. The causes of flooding, you've heard some already this morning. Uh, Dr. Gong mentioned that the Greenland ice sheets melting would contribute a, a maximum of seven meters to sea level rise. The expanding volume of the ocean is contributing to it. Here in Virginia, we have land subsidence as a real issue due to isostatic glacial rebound, um, due to overtapping of our aquifer underground, and that means that we call it relative sea level rise. So sea level rise, again, it's not one number, and it's different on the different coasts and in different areas, and that's important to keep in mind. So what do we need to do to address sea level rise when it's somewhat of a shifting problem but a constant problem? Um, well, first of all, a whole of government approach is clearly called for, and I think our panelists are going to talk about that. Um, Sea level rise not being a one number to predict for means you need ranges, you need numbers that are authorized for government at all different levels to use so that when they're doing their infrastructure planning, they know what, what's the correct number to use that will be accepted by the public and by the government agencies. Um, and the, a range of responses, different scenarios, dis there are different risk levels as well for different kinds of infrastructure, whether it's a road or a hospital or a house, there may be different risk tolerance for the different kinds of projects. And obviously there's a need in our region in particular to coordinate with the military. Um, I failed to note earlier Admiral Quigley, who was part of our fall conference last year and part of the whole of government panel as well in April. And uh, he's very good at pointing out we've got to fix the fact that we have one set of issues up to the baseline, defense line, and then another set, and we can't cross over. We need to have some congressional authorizations to help us with that. So we're looking for some innovative solutions, and our panelists are going to talk about what they've encountered. Um, one thing we look at here in Virginia is incentives. Norfolk, for example, has just adopted their new zoning ordinance very courageously, um, which uses a carrot rather than a stick and says, come develop on the higher ground. We'll give you the incentive if you put some uh, some pr protections in place on the lower ground that tends to flood will help you to develop on the higher ground. Uh, probably had never heard it summarized quite that quickly before, right? But that's the gist. Uh, Hampton also has a resilient Hampton project. Similarly, they're looking at a checklist of things that you can do to have a more resilient development project. So incentives and transfer development rights, that's another tool that can be used to try to concentrate your development in areas that are more resilient. All important steps to take. Public education and funding are the ever constant things that we also need to concentrate on. Here in Virginia, we actually have a Virginia Shoreline Resiliency Fund that was created by our General Assembly a couple years ago. It has never been funded. So we just need to take it that next step across the finish line. It's an empty vessel at the moment, but it does, it, the authority is there for localities to do that, to use those funds for grants for mitigation projects so that we can prepare and mitigate future flooding damage. So with that note, I'm going to ask John to discuss. Do yeah. I need to? No, I can, I can, whichever way we're going to do this. Um, to discuss the recent report that you all put out about sea level rise. Sure. I, um, so I, I can talk for an hour or three on this, or I can talk for five or ten minutes, and I'm going to go somewhere in between, I think. Um, so, so, so this morning I sort of set up the, the conversation that I thought we were going to have today as far as, okay, we've assessed. Um, we had a, a recent report on sea level rise that we did. Um, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists has done sea level rise reports. There have been a, a number of them, and we all acknowledge that the sea level is rising. We heard, we saw data uh, earlier this morning about how the Arctic ice is melting. Um, I, think, I think we should all take a deep breath and understand that that seven meters at the high end, if the sheet, you know, the ice sheet slides off of Greenland, 
look around this room. These walls are not seven meters high. Um, that's how much water we're talking about uh, globally. Okay, so so that's a that's an effect. Um, the the uh, and that's we're playing Russian roulette. Uh, no pun intended. Um, the the uh, you know sort of you never know when that's going to happen. But until then, we've got the pace that we've got that we're dealing with, and and so. The sea level rise that we're dealing with at our installations, and as we articulated in our report, has significant operational impacts at a variety of bases and sort of the front lines uh, of, of this particular issue is Norfolk and the Hampton Roads area. I want to talk a little bit about resilience. And this, this will feed into, I want, I want to, uh, the preponderance of my remarks, I want to talk about how do you prepare? Because we've assessed, now we want to prepare. But let's talk about joint base Langley Eustis. Yes, I call it a joint base. I don't call it Langley Air Force Base. Uh, it, is a, it is joint base Langley Eustis. I, um, I used to run the installation shop uh, at DOD, and we made all these joint bases. And you know, every once in a while, I slip and call it an Air Force Base. No, it's a joint base. Anyway, they have a, uh, they have a flooding problem. And when a runway floods, uh, then you cannot actually you know, conduct missions. It has operational impacts. Years ago, you know, thinking back before we really started preparing and trying to improve resilience for recurrent flooding, um, when a big flood would occur, it could do tens of millions of dollars of damage at a base like that, and it had. And I had, I'm remembering back to slides I saw back in the Pentagon. But, but, but see, what they did was they started preparing for that sort of thing. So they developed a sandbag plan. Sandbags, not high tech. And the next time a comparable uh, large storm came through, when they had deployed their sandbag plan, instead of uh, tens of millions of dollars of damage, it was on the order of single-digit millions of dollars of damage. You can mitigate significant amounts of risk if you prepare for it, if you acknowledge it. I saw a presentation uh, earlier this year uh, from the Air Force talking about Joint Base Langley Eustis, and they had put what's called door dams in place. So they got, sent, they got tired of deploying sandbags. It's labor intensive. And what they did was they put actual metal structures on the, on the doors of buildings that were at the, at the appropriate sea levels where they could just slide down the dam into the metal structure in front of the door uh, to block the water from getting into the building. And so people are becoming, and so now the resilience, the effort to become resilient uh, is much less and the damage is much less. My point is, is that a lot of these things are not high tech, and a lot of them can be done with a, a, a minimum amount of effort. There are high price things too. Don't don't get me wrong. Um, uh, Dave Titley can t talk all about the price of, of a lot of the stuff the Navy has to do in the Arctic, and he's right. And all the things we have to do in our infrastructure if the sea levels rise to seven meters. Um, yes, there's a lot of expensive things, but there's but those things hopefully are some years off. And so in the immediate term, to become more resilient. In my mind, what resilience means is, is that you know the bad stuff can happen, and you can can you resume operations quickly, and do less damage. It shows up in terms of impact to mission and impact to cost. And if you want to be able to have a resilient mission, you want it to to not care that there's a hurricane or to not care that there's a flood. If you want to to have a sort of a cost resilient enterprise, you want it you know those storms not to do the damage that they do. So okay, now let's think about this for a second. We've assessed, now what do we do to prepare? And I have sort of four categories that I'm gonna talk through today. Some of this is based off of my experience in the building, some of it's uh, based on reports that we've done. I will say this, the uh, Center for Climate and Security, uh, www.climateandsecurity.org, uh, for, for, uh, for all of you in the room and everybody who's watching on the live stream, um, it has not only our sea level rise report, but also a report called Responsibility to Prepare, which has a series of recommendations for the federal government for how to approach what are some things that we think are reasonable preparations to make uh, to deal with the impacts of climate change. These are near future types of things that we're talking about. This isn't necessarily <clears throat> by as many icebreakers as the Russians or anything like that. Now this, but but there, are, there are a series of things, and I'll touch on some of them here, mix in. So uh, I want to hit four things real quick 
um, is my experience that people don't necessarily remember everything you talked about the day ne the next day. So I'm going to sort of try and come up with a mnemonic here on the fly to, to help you remember what we're going to do to prepare. And they're all going to be P things. So first thing we need to do is plan. You, you, at a base like Norfolk, they may know that there's a problem. They may know they flood. But what do you do? What, what is the average person supposed to do in that, uh, you know, to deal with it? Well, you need a plan. There's a, uh, Congress actually uh, passed a, a law uh, last year that required DOD to go out there and identify which bases are the most vulnerable. Ten bases per service. What are your top ten? Well, that involves having to think through and figure out what they are. I'm going to guess that Norfolk's on the list for the Navy. Um, what I think they need to do next is come up with, or come up with, Congress probably ought to tell the department to do this, but even if they don't, um, to come up with a plan for each one of those bases. So, okay, now that you're on this list, now that DOD has identified you as one of the most vulnerable locations, what is your plan? What are you going to do about it? If the, what is your risk? So let's say it's sea level rise for the sake of discussion. What are you going to do? Do you have um, sea uh, sandbag plans or door dams in place for your vulnerable buildings? What are you doing for, as far as your master plan on that base? There was a, a requirement. Both the House and Senate this year um, required DOD to incorporate climate change considerations in their installation master planning. Every base has a master plan. And it's sort of, uh, okay, the next building I'm going to build is over here, or I want to put uh, these types of buildings over in this part of the base. They have this, these plans. Well, they know what they're sea level, uh, you know, how many uh, meters above sea level they are at each particular location. They know how to plan their base. Congress told the department to incorporate in its guidance that they need to take into account climate change for those types of things, that, that, that the flooding is going to change. This is a really good example. Both of these are good examples of the fact that Congress is actually becoming more and more bipartisan on this issue. As long as we're not talking about what causes the climate change, we're talking about how, does DIA, how do you protect our military from this issue. There's a lot of common sense, practical things that go on in Congress uh, that move the ball forward. So, so it's, it, that's actually a really good news story. But we have, we can steal this model from other things where DOD already has lots of plans on our bases. They have master plans, and that's, that's true. But they also have, you know, integrated natural resource management plans. They have uh, comprehensive encroachment plans. They, they, they have lots of things where they think, think through all the impacts on a base. If there was a requirement for a climate plan on a base, a climate resilience uh, impact plan, or however you want, you're going to come up with a good acronym so people can actually remember it. And I'm, I, I, I haven't done that yet. But, but you, you don't want it to be like, a climate resilience adaptation plan that would that wouldn't work very well, um, but 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 the fact of the matter is they do need a plan, something with projects, something with a list, something with prioritization. That if you do get money, you're going to spend it on these things. That's require. That's I think a high priority in, in a t in, in a, with a problem that where you have years and or decades to deal with things. Planning up front is good and is required, and we'll come up with the list of the to-do list for later. Second thing you need to do, P's, right? Planning, partnering. We have lots of people from local, where there's a whole of government conversation here, partnering. Um, when I was at DOD, I sponsored these three uh, pilot projects, we called them, where you were supposed to try and have, a, have the military installations who are dealing with climate change partner with local communities and try and figure out um, how they could work together. Now, the thing about a pilot is that it's supposed to identify what works and what doesn't work really well. And, you know, there are plenty of stories about, you know, Norfolk, this is the Hampton Roads area was the Navy pilot. Um, uh, you know, some things maybe didn't work so well. I understand that. Um, I, you know, I've gotten the, the feedback, but they never really figured out uh, what the next step was from that set of lessons. What the department really needs to do, and what local communities probably need to do too, is figure out how, what is the framework for partnering, what are the questions that people need to ask each other, and who do they need to know from inside the base to outside the base in order to be able to deal with these problems? Because the, ba the problems go across the base lines. The problem, the, the sea level doesn't, doesn't care where the fence line is. 
And oh, by the way, I was talking about you know, how indispensable the communities are to most bases. Let's say your wastewater plant is off base. Let's say it's really close to sea level. Let's say you have a really big problem when you can't flush your toilets anymore. So, you know, the, the, they're, you know not to bring up a graphic example or anything like that, but the, the, the point is, is that these, that's one of a long list of things. I'm not being comprehensive here. There's a long list of things that people need to figure out. The, the road into Norfolk, the main road into Norfolk is gonna be flooding multiple hours a day in 20 years. What do you do about that? What do you do when you can't get into the base for two hours a day? What do you do when that lands in rush hour? That's a problem. And it's a projection, it's a study, and I understand all that. But there needs to be some way for the local community and the base to work together to mitigate your transportation problems because the base relies on the community for a lot of its transportation infrastructure, for example. So how do you figure that out? And then how do you figure it out? How do you, what do you do when you have lots of bases and lots of communities? Well, that makes a mess is what it makes. And um, I'm sorry that you all have to deal with that because that's what we got here. Um, it makes it very difficult. But you have to figure out how to partner. Um, promulgating policy. So planning, partnering, policy. Po there, there are plenty of policies one can issue that don't cost money. You know, we were talking, I asked the question earlier about how, you know, how, how many resources are, are you devoting to the, uh, this in Virginia? And it wasn't really a fair question. I, I you know, back in the last administration, uh, you know, I remember when the White House wanted to ask for these big green climate funds, and they said, oh, we're going to ask for $2 billion. And I said, that's great. You've just given the Republican Congress a $2 billion offset. It's, they're going to love you for that, because they'll just cut it and spend it on other things. And, 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 um, and that's OK. Um, but I realized that at DOD, we didn't want to ask for more money for climate mitigation, because it would just get cut. But sometimes when you spend $10 billion a year on military construction every single year, it's about how you spend your money, not what money you spend. We didn't necessarily need more money. We needed to spend our money more wisely and to take certain things into account. So we put policy in place about how you spend that money and that it had to take climate into account. These are the things that are bipartisan and are perfectly comfortable. Everybody's happy with that. The, the, there are a whole, I can list off a bunch of these things. There's a bunch in our report, but just to, to tick off a, a, a few, um, you know, I was just talking about roads into bases. Well, uh, Congress uh, put into pl place a, an expansion that allows the Defense Access Roads Program to leverage, uh, to talk about uh, mitigating climate effects. So that essentially means that there's authorities in place that will allow DOD to spend a little bit of money on, uh, on that kind of problem, on trying to get access to the base on improving that infrastructure. Um, there, there was another bipartisan bill in Congress um, that was uh, introduced by Senators Moran from Kansas and Schatz from Hawaii. They were the, the chair and ranking member of the Military Construction Appropriations uh, subcommittee in, in the Senate. And they introduced a bill that set a flood protection standard of two feet uh, additional above uh, previous planning estimates for uh, you basically have to build your building sire. Because DOD self-insures. They can't rely on somebody else bailing them out. So they basically said any new construction, you have to plan for it to flood more often and build your buildings higher. It was bipartisan. It got incorporated into the defense, appropriate, uh, defense authorization bill. Um, and that's moving forward as well. Bipartisan is the way to go on all of this stuff. There is adaptation is not necessarily a partisan issue. And especially when you start talking about things that aren't about new resources, but about how you spend your money. So, so I, and I could go into a long list there too. All right, so, so planning, partnering, policy. Uh, the, the last one, and I was trying to figure out how to turn this into a P, but I want, I want to add a thought. Some of this is about protecting mission, not infrastructure, okay? Um, it, sometimes it's about thinking through how you do your mission assurance in, in, in having the ability to move your mission away from a place that's impacted by climate impacts. And so we talk about 
energy resilience a lot and, and what happens when there's outages, when, there's, when you have the big storms. Sometimes you have to move your assets. Sometimes you need a backup in another location that's not as impacted by the climate impacts. If you're thinking out of the box and you're thinking creatively, those mission owners need to be figure, thinking through how do I um, essentially evacuate to another location? What's my contingency site? How do I work through my ability to continue to do my job resiliently in the face of a crisis, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm staying in the same location. But all of these things are planning things. This is, most, almost everything I just listed didn't, doesn't involve spending like infrastructure dollars. It's about how you spend things. Because, it, because it's very difficult to get additional money for things, especially at scale. Anybody want to build a seawall around Norfolk? If you do, it's going to cost a lot of money. And sometimes the first steps are the ones you need to do instead. I got asked at a forum, sorry, I'm talking too long. I don't know, so somebody had a card that was thinking about having cards for me. Um, 107. All right, um, let, me, let me finish with an a, a anecdote. Um, I was at a forum that at ODU maybe three, four years ago, I was uh, still at DOD. And, um, and one of the questions was, okay, <laughs> So since all this flooding is happening, and since you expect the sea level rise, are you going to move Norfolk to somewhere else? Because I, I owned the uh, base closure accounts. I, I, that's, that, was my, that was my office, too. And I said, are you kidding me? If you can do things with you know, rising, uh, uh, in improving construction standards and set uh, in, in doing master planning, why on earth would I replace a $20 billion installation someplace else when it's in an ideal location already, except for the fact that it floods all the time? And so, and so you gotta think that through. Sometimes the investment, yeah. <laughs> well, but it was my, it was my answer uh, several years ago too. And, and, and so, so let's not overreact. Let's do what we can do to mitigate the problems uh, that we're dealing with today. Um, we can talk all we want about how much sea level, sea level we're going to have in 100 years, but I would remind you that a lot of bases that we have today we didn't have 100 years ago. 100 years ago was 1918. Many of the bases that are these huge behemoths around the country today weren't, they weren't here. Who knows what we're going to have in 2118? And trying to react today to that scenario isn't necessarily the first thing you need to do. D DOD spent $1.2 billion this last year in hurricane damage uh, repairs. $1.2 billion, DOD only. This is nobody else. There's a bunch of other money in the emergency spending. That's a lot of money. But it also shows that DOD is willing, or in Congress, is willing to appropriate money uh, when something bad happens because of all these climate imp imp impacts. You, you're not necessarily going to do things in advance, but if you can do something in advance, just like that Langley example, where they reduced the amount of damage by orders of magnitude by planning, then maybe that $1.2 billion will get mitigated the next time there's hurricane season. If people start thinking about how to become more resilient. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Admiral Phillips about lessons she's learned in her work in this arena and about an interesting project on the West Coast, which required regional collaboration. Okay. Can you all hear me if I sit here and have this? I want to make sure it's in the right place. Yes? Okay. No? Who said no? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> all right. Definitely yes. All right. Um, so. Good afternoon, um, and I'm honored to be here with everyone, and particularly with um, my distinguished colleagues, uh, the Honorable John Conger, who we feared greatly during the pilot project uh, because it seemed <laughs> like it was going to live or die on whether or not he allowed the Navy to participate and uh, in, in many circumstances. And also, Elizabeth, thank you for, for inviting me. And again, a thanks to Heather and uh, Dr. Kay and also John for putting this together. Uh, Heather looks calm over there, but the old analogy of the doc calm on the top, paddling hard on the bottom. Um, took quite a bit to put this together. It was somewhat short notice, and it's interesting time of year, so 
Uh, we appreciate all your efforts in pulling it together at the last minute. Thank you. Um, so I was asked today to speak about interesting ways that perhaps other regions are addressing, with similar challenges to us, are addressing those challenges. Um, how are they looking forward? How are they planning? How are they collaborating across the whole of government and community? Are they doing it successfully? And, and, and what have their shortfalls been, um, if any? And, and in some cases, some are too new to really predict at this point. Um, I love to talk about the pilot project, and I'll get there. But I think what I'd like to do first is talk about four other areas that are doing are challenged as we are and how they are approaching it and then tie in the commonalities there and then tie those into the outcomes of the pilot project that was conducted here in the Hampton Roads region from 2014 to 2016. Um, so the four other areas are, and some have already been mentioned today, uh, Greater New Orleans, uh, Southeast Flor Florida's Regional Climate, Challenge, Ch Climate Change Compact, uh, Charleston Resilience Network, and some interesting new activity in San Diego uh, between the uh, Greater Port District of San Diego and the Commander Navy Region Southwest in San Diego, um, who by chance have been operating and working together for a long time. And uh, this is just another step in that long-standing partnership. So starting with New Orleans. New Orleans was mentioned earlier today already. Um, in New Orleans, uh, who has been gone through, uh, in order to get the kind of money that you have in, in Louisiana to deal with the issues that they are dealing with in Louisiana, you have to go through an incredibly damaging and deadly hurricane followed by an oil spill. So let's not forget that. So there's a conversation about how much money there is in New Orleans. Well, you had to go through hell to get that money. Um, Greater New Orleans Incorporated is the Regional Economic Development Center in New Orleans and Within that is uh, the Greater New Orleans Urban Water Collaborative, fund, kind of nestled up under their economic development agency, which is implementing the Greater New Orleans Urban Water Plan, which has been developed as a result of the challenges of, Kat namely K Katrina, mainly Katrina, and is supported by some Katrina money, and then they've also got some BP money there. Um, on a larger level in Louisiana, there's the Coastal Res Restoration and Protection Authority, which I believe Secretary Sachs mentioned. That was uh, implemented under Governor Jindal's tender, tenure uh, post Katrina, uh, really, and BP oil spill to uh, funded to um, with hundreds. I have seen a $750 million a year figure. Um, don't know how accurate that is at the current time. Uh, which is to look at restoring the coast of Louisiana, because remember they have another problem there. It's eroding away at a rapid rate, you know, a football field an hour more or less, um, and preserving, maintaining their existing water protection infrastructure and improving their system so that they can better support them being who they are over time, considering that they are very much below sea level, also have a subsidence problem, and of course have the tremendous delta erosion challenges. They have written several master plans, the most recent 2017 coastal master plan, they being Louisiana writ large, has been approved by the General Assembly just, just recently in the last few months. It commits a billion dollars a year for 50 years to supporting the restoration of the Delta and other environmental priorities as required, mainly keeping water out, and as under the auspices of this Coastal Restoration and Protection Authority. So armed with a lot of money, uh, oh, by the way, the estimate for the total cost over time, 150 with a B billion. So they've committed to 50 billion, a billion a year for 50 years, but the actual estimate of the challenge is much greater than that. So just so you know the kind of money we're talking about here. Um, that's Louisiana. Southeast Florida, Regional Climate Change Compact. Oh, I should mention one other thing, the initial work to get the Greater New Orleans Urban Water Collaborative started and really generate the urban water plan, which was done by David Wagoner, Wagoner and Ball. Some of you are aware of his work because he's also working here with the city of Norfolk and the city of Hampton, um, was funded at least in part by the Greater New Orleans Foundation. So the community foundation there helped fund some of this work to get this started along with other nonprofits. Blue Moon Fund was a big one also. Many people know that. So shifting to Southeast Florida. Southeast Florida has a totally different strategy. The four counties at the very tip of Florida have formed, come together to form the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Compact. Three counties are in one planning district, a fourth is in, a th is in another, Broward, Miami-Dade, Monroe, and Palm Beach. This was actually established in January 2010, and the idea was to set standards, 
work with a, collabor a consortium of universities, which they have in South Florida, to help give them the best possible science and engineering technology so that they could collaborate on best practices for the South Florida region over time. Now, we know South Florida has a major flooding problem. They also have a huge problem, which we're starting to see here, of sunny day flooding. They're sitting on porous limestone, so their water and aquifer is much more challenged, their drinking water, than ours is at the moment. Um, because salt water is penetrating into their freshwater lens. Um, and and you know, many of you have probably seen the king tide flooding uh, pictures of people waiting down the street in you know, very expensive parts of downtown Miami. Um, so the challenges there are certainly legion. They are accelerating, as, as we are all dealing with. They also have a regional climate action plan looking at how to coordinate across southeast, southern Florida best practices for local entities, uh, including business community and, and the nonprofit community. So people are working together to make progress. They have passed bond initiatives, one very pop well publicized one last year, um, only for South Beach to the tune of 450 million, I think. Um, or not quite that much, it was something around, it was around more like 350 to help them with their very much also publicized raising of roads and putting a pump, placing pumps to help get water out of South Beach when they have uh, high tides or extreme rain events. So um, that's what's going on in South Florida. It is, the South Florida Compact has, is not a state entity. Um, they have done that deliberately because you may remember they have a rather uh, conservative state government. And the concern, in my opinion, oh, by the way, I had a very good law professor at Mason who said, make sure people say it's in your, your say it's in your opinion if it is in your opinion. So um, in my opinion, they are uh, very thoughtful in that regard by not turning themselves into a state entity because then they could be undone as a state entity and perhaps prohibited from doing some of the work they're doing. So the four counties have come together now to fund the work that this organization does. Um, and they continue to move forward. One of the most urgent things they have done is to pick a set of sea level rise scenario curves that they are planning towards that are common across the region, the four counties, and all the cities that are in them. It's not a Dillon Rule state. So they, they will update that over time. The universities will make a recommendation as to whether they should change the curves, make them less understand where they are in the scenarios, and then adapt their planning requirements based on the expected sea level for futuristic planning over time. So. Great idea, something they've been able to do with success. And they continue to build on these regional standards that they are setting so that they can all plan and work and collaborate together as they move forward. Charleston Resilience Network. This one is new to me. I've only learned about this in the last year or so. Um, but the city of Charleston, largest city in South Carolina, a fastest growing city in South Carolina, also with some military presence, um, has put together, uh, chaired voluntarily by Dan Berger, who is uh, a member of the Department of DEQ in the state of uh, South Carolina, but is doing this with the state's permission as a volunteer, to oversee a collaboration of public, private, and nonprofit organizations. Let me say that again. Public, private, and nonprofit organizations to enhance the resilience of the Charleston, greater Charleston area. Um, it includes a number of cities outside of Charleston in that area, but it also includes major businesses that are present in the city of Charleston and major nonprofits that are present in the city of Charleston, also with the support of the Charleston Community Foundation and others, they have other sponsors. What they have done is, in addition to coming, to coming up with regional standards and collaborative ideas and best practices that they want to share and work on together, they've also come together to understand what kinds of work they need to do to better prepare for adaptation planning. And they've gone after grants in a collaborative way so that they can get answers to those questions through NOAA and through other organizations. Um, so that their biggest, you know, practice, best practice right now that I would say we can take away for this region is a collaborative effort to go after grants to get money to do the kinds of research and help and process development that they can use then to implement adaptation strategies for the region. So uh, very interesting process, seems to be going well. Um, it is all volunteer, uh, and like I said, it is including uh, Berkeley, Charleston, Dorchester counties, a number of the small cities, and the major business indus and industry players in the region, as well as major philanthropic and nonprofits in the region. So they have different levels of participation. Um, 
organizing committee, advising members, partnering organizations. Oh, by the way, advising members, Army Corps, Joint Base, uh, most of the federal entities that couldn't maybe be a, a voting member can serve as an advisory member. So, um, progress. Finally, San Diego. In May of this year, there were a couple of news reports that came out about um, a collaborative memorandum of agreement between the Unified Port District of San Diego and Commander Navy Region Southwest. So obviously, great many similarities between San Diego and the large military naval facility there and this region and the large naval facility here. And I would add, in our case, we have, as you all well know, all these other federal entities that are here. I mean, that's what Craig does every day is, is uh, work to preserve and ensure relationships between the cities and those federal entities. So um, in San Diego, the unique circumstance that kind of exists here and has existed for a while is that the greater port district of San Diego actually owns most of the waterfront in the San Diego region. They were deeded by the state land management or lands commission in the early 60s, all the property that didn't belong to the military, minus a little bit of, there's some uh, National Wildlife Foundation property and some state park property, probably some national park property, but the rest of the port, 90%, is split between the Greater Unified Port District of San Diego and the Navy. That's who owns most all of San Diego Bay. So for those who've never been out there, San Diego Bay is, um, because it's pretty short sea detail, not as short as Jacksonville, we're pretty short, um, comes in from the west to starts uh, with a bluff, a headland, Point Loma, and then gets rapidly uh, shallower, shallower, shallower into a wetland area in the southern end of the bay. So the southern end of the, 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 the entrance is a deep natural port past a headland around Coronado Island, which isn't really an island, and then it ends in a, a shoaling up wetland marshland area full of birds and fish, and, and uh, that's the southern end of the, chest of the of San Diego Bay. So the whole mission of the port over time has been to preserve and use the property that they own, all of the shoreline, either in, in a natural capacity or for the benefit of the people of San Diego County and, and California. So they are completely self-sufficient. They make their money by leasing property and, and in some cases from uh, the profits that are made by that property that they are leasing. Uh, but they are, so all those hotels along the waterfront in San Diego, that terrific kind of you know, wild and very modern, upgraded all the time waterfront, that all belongs to the San Diego Unified Port District or it belongs to the US Navy um, or other industries that are, uh, it's, they're leasing their property from the San Diego Unified Port District. So, this, the state of California's interest was there's five cities, San Diego, National City, Chula Vista, Imperial Beach, and Coronado. Rather than have them all fighting with each other for what to do with the port, let's, see, let's deed it uh, to the port district. The Navy owns the rest, and then the port district will be responsible for managing this over time. So California is very progressive with environmental laws, many of you are well aware. And, and so the Navy and the Port District have been collaborating for years to make sure they were able to meet requirement law and statute implemented at the federal level but also at the state level. Um, as early as the late 90s, they had together put together an integrated natural resources management plan, which was revised in 2013. Um, so, so they have a long history of collaborating on environmental issues because they had to, really. Um, they also developed collaboratively a sea level rise adaptation strategy for San Diego Bay. This was really funded by the San Diego Community Foundation. Ding, there's that community foundation bell going off again. Um, and uh, done by uh, local governments for sustainability, which is kind of a uh, nonprofit that helped with pull together federal, state, local, business, and nonprofits into one entity looking at uh, sea level rise adaptation strategies for San Diego Bay. So this signing of a collaborative memorandum of agreement, which basically says that the two entities will share scientific data uh, where they can, we've talked about that earlier today also, and also share planning and strategies over time is really taking something they're already doing, but they've been doing it on a case-by-case -case basis, and helping them come together so they can look long range for the future and plan together collaboratively for how to manage San Diego Bay. Uh, because they are the two big landowners. The port is also driven in this regard by a bill passed by the California General, General Assembly in 2013, Assembly Bill 691, 
which basically says that anybody that owns deeded land, any entity that owns deeded land that will be impacted by sea level rise must, uh, granted public trust land, I think is the appropriate term here, no later than July 1, 2019, so a year, uh, develop a plan for how they will mitigate and adapt that land use over time for sea level rise impact and do more than just say yes it's impacted and yes we need to make changes. Come up with a long range plan for how they're going to make changes and what the cost of those changes will be over time. So quite a bit of work for the Port District, Unified Port District. Uh, they are diligently in progress uh, preparing themselves for what they need to do here, but they know it, they've known it's coming, so it's not like it's in new news. But this, they see this memorandum of agreement as a step in that process so that they can further collaborate with the Navy over time. Um, the Navy sees it as an opportunity for them to make sure they're aligned with the port because they are inextricably linked. The dependencies and interdependencies between the two are undeniable, and um, they see it as a way for them to move forward collaboratively within the region. So. Uh, Still, I think, not officially signed. Does anybody, a couple Navy folks here. Rumor has it that uh, at the last minute there were some minor, like, puppy to small dog changes and, and it still has to be uh, finalized, but it will be. And um, so this is something that we could find in this region might be an option for us, considering the huge federal presence here and the waterfront that so much of it is engaged with the huge maintenance presence here, which by the way is all private industry. Where are these people in this process in this region? Crickets or chirping crickets. Um, the Port of San Diego, the Port of San Diego, the Port of Norfolk, which is very engaged in this region in making progress not only to support and sustain their own facilities, de de developing their own sustainability master plan, but also collaborating well with their federal partners throughout the region. So how do we pull all these entities together here to make our own regional plan over time. So speaking of P words and planning, um, there are some consistencies amongst these ports and these issues, these, for these processes. First, um, Charleston, Norfolk, and uh, let's see, what's my other one? Um, San Diego are all critical um, national security ports. They're, they're under MARAD's list of the top 17 uh, uh, critical ports in the country, those three are on it. Uh, San Diego is San Diego is on it, New Orleans is not on it, and um, what was my other one? I'm missing one. Um, Miami is not on that list, sorry. Um, so those are three things that the cities have in common. The marriage strategic ports is usually the technical effort. Uh, the other thing that is common across almost all of these is the effort to tie together, someone mentioned a whole of society this morning, well, a whole of government and community, and also to tie the work to economic developments within the region. So Virginia, as a state, has worked so hard on Go Virginia and all of the economic development initiatives that go with that, well, in this region, if we aren't looking at this issue, all of the rest of the economic development effort that has any long-term projections to it uh, is of questionable value because of the impact this will have on it over time. So on the other hand, if we can get ahead of this issue and show that we have a plan and a regional solution and that we are working towards the challenges that are coming our way, that will be an economic incentive, not only to work within that arena, um, but for other businesses and industries to consider staying here and working with the community rather than looking at other options. So. Um, the other things that are, they have in common are setting standards, support of universities for the best possible science, data collection and analysis, which I didn't bring up earlier, but New Orleans has the best example of that, um, an understanding of what infrastructure is vulnerable and how they want to prioritize across that infrastructure so that they can sort out how they will pay for what they know is coming. All of these things, were outcomes of the pilot project that was done here 2014 to 2016. And in addition, there was a recommendation to take uh, for the Planning District Commission, and they are not represented here, so I'm not throwing them under the bus, they're just not here today, to take a look at what kind of organization could be created in this region that would give us the opportunity to move forward in a collaborative way um, either as a designated special service district authority or with joint exercise of local government powers by agreement. I'm copying this right out of our resolution, uh, saying this right out of our resolution language. Um, 
which would be required under the laws of the state of Virginia so that a cities could collaborate here um, with the authority of the state government. So last year, Senator Linwood Lewis, my state senator, um, did put forth a bill in the General Assembly to establish such an authority. It made it out of committee, it didn't make it out of the Senate. It takes five years to get anything state, through state government in Virginia, so we got four years to go. Meanwhile, we could be coming together on a voluntary basis as cities and municipalities, pulling in the business community, pulling in the federal entities, pulling in the nonprofits, and starting to look at how we can prioritize what we need to do here. Because all of these other regions are doing this. They have gone out and set up their own individual entities. Most of them are set up, there's a for-profit or a, a structured entity, and then there are nonprofits entities that help collaborate al along with that. They've figured out ways to fund those things, and they have specific goals they're going after collaboratively as a region, going after federal dollars to do studies, going after federal dollars to do projects, going after state dollars. Um, but I can tell you that if we keep doing things one city at a time, which is what is happening here, and there is a lot of work going on at the city level. You all that live here certainly know this, but it is all still stovepiped. The business community is not a big player. Some are, many are not. Good question, don't know why not. And we still don't have an overarching private nonprofit entity pulling all the nonprofits in this region together that do great work here, <laughs> tremendous work, but are all still doing their own thing. And so what are they all doing? Competing for the same money, competing for the same grants, competing for the same donors. Same thing's happening at the, at the city level. Competing for the same grants, competing for the same dollars, competing for the same federal authorities. What if we all collaborated, figured out what our priorities were, and then went after that as a group? Now someone will say, wait, we did that for the National Disaster Resilience Competition grant and only one city got the money. Yes, you're right. Bad behavior, that did happen. I think we just lost the air conditioning too, that's another story. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that that isn't the way forward. This is the way forward. We've gotta collaborate. Other cities are doing it. They're showing it can be done successfully. It just takes the will and it takes leadership. Thank you for your time. Well, that's the perfect note for my first question for you, actually. Perfect note to end on. Um, we've talked quite a bit today about the whole of government approach, all the different layers of government needing to be involved in the discussion, and we've talked about the need for public education so people can make good decisions when they purchase properties and they can have the knowledge to back uh, and support efforts to deal with sea level rise. Um, but the business sector, the private sector, seems to be one untapped area that we need to pursue. And uh, one thing we've talked about a lot as well is the need to do an assessment of the risk for infrastructure of all kinds, for roads, for wastewater treatment, for our food source as the salt water intrudes on our agricultural fields, um, and public health and hospitals, et cetera. So is that a, an opportunity for the business sector to get involved uh, or in helping to define resilience? How would you all see the private sector having a good, solid role in our response to this? I, yep, go ahead. <laughs> so, so keep in mind, I suppose, that the business sector is only going to do what's in its own interest, right? Um, uh, I know there's good citizen stuff that goes on, but if they, I suppose that the folks you want to talk to the most are the ones that, that aren't able to leave. You know, if they're stuck, I, I'm just being cynical here. Um, but if you've got a situation where it's going to cost them too much to move and it's more in their interest to try and figure out how to make things more resilient, um, that those are the partners that, that are going to have the, the biggest dog in being able to, to contribute to this and that the ones you're going to be able to bring in. I don't know what the interpersonal dynamics are in this particular area, um, but, but that'd, be, that'd be where I'd start, and you actually know what's going on. So you can probably... um, I, I think, the, well, we all know, those of us who live here, that the business community um, I'll, kind of, I'll put my little disclaimer in here again, in my opinion, um, has been very reluctant to address this because they fear that it will contaminate economic development efforts. So if we talk about the fact that we have a sea level rise problem in, in Norfolk or Virginia Beach or anywhere in Hampton Roads, that that'll scare away business and industry golly, we won't have as many breweries and, and other things. Um, and they'll all run for the hills and uh, 
so don't talk about it and it won't happen. I mean, and that's really, that's really a big piece of this, or at least it has been. Um, so the fact that people's feet are wet, you know, driving down Llewellyn Avenue, which is one of my favorite examples to give because it's so near to my house. Um, in fact, it's probably flooding like right now and it's definitely gonna flood this evening at the next tide cycle. Um, that seems to be irrelevant. But what started to change the tune here was Hurricane Matthew, really, which was fall of 2016, but um, it wasn't even a hurricane when it rolled through here. Virginia Beach took the brunt of it. And so Virginia Beach was one of the cities who was very reluctant to talk about any specific level um, of sea level rise over three feet. But when you had million dollar homes in Astral Park with water in them, uh, suddenly the city council began to get a lot of pressure that they hadn't been getting before. So we began to see the dam break in Virginia Beach as far as acknowledging that there's a challenge. Um, and so progress has been made. I mean, Virginia Beach has made progress. They took a step backwards this year, but it'll, I think they will proceed forward with their initial plan. Um, so that was one of the bigger cities who was less interested in doing things, and now they have changed their tune. Uh, Norfolk certainly has been very proactive all along. Hampton is very proactive. Portsmouth is getting into the act, but the challenge you have is Portsmouth is a very small city. 50% of their land mass, this is Craig's statistic, um, is taken up by federal property. So they're already at risk from, they, they can't charge, they don't have the tax base that, yeah. that other cities have. Um, and even if they did have it, let's use Norfolk as an example. We have this tremendous, really innovative new zoning ordinance for a city that's 97% built out. So it's really gonna impact future construction, but how much future construction is there gonna be? You know, yeah, it's gonna make things better, definitely. But it's not like Virginia Beach, where there's an opportunity for a lot of future construction. They could really use an ordinance like this to really put some teeth into their future zoning requirements. But there is not an interest in that city, at, in my opinion, at this moment, for putting something with that much teeth in place. So we have this conundrum of we are a water-based economy. It's federal, Dollars, Navy, you know, Joint Base, Langley, Eustis, all the armies, boats, Coast Guard, you name it, dependent on the water. It's the port of Virginia and the huge maritime ship repair industry and uh, federal and otherwise, that's dependent on the water. It's tourism. Why do people come here as tourists? The water, that's what they're interested in. And waterfront property is a big portion of the income for most cities, tax base from the waterfront property. So the thing that is driving our income is the thing that is gonna take our income away. So we have this wicked problem, this conundrum of how do we, how do we reconcile these two pressures and tensions? And that I think manifests itself in the business community, particularly short term thinking, I'll deal with the emergency management piece. That part they understand, but the long term projection of what's gonna happen over time, they're just not there yet. And, and another reason, you have to be honest, is the insurance industry and the mortgage industry and the reinsurers aren't holding their feet to the fire. So until somebody starts turning down mortgages, which has started to happen in Miami, at least for long, large developments, condos, um, we're not, you know, but the problem is when that does happen, the whole industry here will collapse. The building industry, the real estate industry, so how do you get enough interest to make change now before that happens, so that you're prepared when you get to the point where, you know what, you may not get a 30-year mortgage to build a house on Willoughby Spit, as an example. So did you see in, the, in for fragile. example, Miami or in San Diego, where they're making a regional effort, did, what did you see? Were there certain steps or things that occurred that forced them into a more regional approach? Well, in California, it's the very, um, strong state oversight and law in the interest of environment. I mean, I mean, it's a green state, let's face it. I mean, they're all over climate, I mean, they're all over. So the two definitions we never talked about that everybody mixes and matches, mitigation and adaptation. In the context of this part of Virginia, adaptation is what you do to solve the flooding problem and mitigation is what you do to reduce CO2 emissions and never the twain shall meet. Um, so, in California, everything's mitigation, um, but their very strong environmental laws have driven these two entities to collaborate because they had to, to meet the requirements. In some cases, it's federal, but a lot of it's state. Um, in Miami, uh, I think it's, you know, it's a high dollar, value, high dollar area, and, and people get mad when their Porsche is flooded up to the windshield, you know, so 
Um, I think they've been driven by uh, public interest in certain areas to make change, and they have a huge tax base. They can, you know, a lot of very wealthy. Now they have plenty of plenty of underserved population also, but the areas that are the most impacted right now are the higher end areas. So there is a tax base to draw from. So how about if we open it up for questions? Uh, are you going to pass the mic, Kay? Or? Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm um, Mark Ogle. I used to be the accountant for for Virginia. Um, quick question for you, and it's maybe scientific too. Um, I think our, our income here from the port is like $240 million a day, a little higher than that. Um, so when we do close the port down for dredging, it's a big problem. The advantage for Virginia is we're the deepest port on the East Coast. Um, this is the science part of the question here. Okay, so as the sea level rises, you know, you would think maybe, maybe we have a deeper draft in the channel, but as the water rises, doesn't that cause more uh, sediment to come into the channels? And will that not drive up um, costs for dredging? Is that being looked at? And also air draft for bridges. Obviously, we had ships going underneath bridges. And uh, are we taking advantage of, or looking at that? I know that's one advantage for Hampton Roads because we have the tunnels versus like New York and they're trying to um, actually elevate their bridges now. But just a thought, I don't know whether we're looking at, is the bottom gonna come up when the water comes up? And that's something to think about. And the advantage for us right now in Hampton Roads is we we're able to dredge the main channel and put it into Craney Island, building out that new terminal. But if we're digging to make it deeper for post Panamax ships, um, there, we might want to look at new sites for dredge spoils. Yeah, I have, I have no idea. What? I mean, that's uh, something that. So the Army Corps, he's not here, right? Greg's left. Greg, Greg left. Um, Coast Guard, do you want to talk about it at all? No, you don't. You don't have to. I don't want to. I don't want to put you on the spot. I just so in the in the so there's a lot of things that are going to happen. I think. Hmm. So the question about the dredge fill and how long the dredging will last. The good news is we have just on the cusp of starting the dredging right, and it's an awesome project, and it's going to do a lot for the region. So um, maybe that's a rallying cry for preserve our maritime industry, um, and I think. It's worth understanding what would happen there. The Western Dredging Association just had their conference here, what, two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. I spoke at that. Those are the people we should ask because there's Dr. Ram Mohan who studies this um, and was a co-chair for the conference. Plus the Army Corps was there also. Uh, so, so there are people who look at this. It's just, I don't think any of them are in this room. Um, the other question I would think about is, is the dredging gonna be a problem with backfill, not sediment fill, before or after we can't get to the port because we have so much road flooding and we can't get to the base because we have so much road flooding. That's an interesting question. I don't know the answer. There's so, where's the scientist in the back of the room? Larry's thinking. Um, so, you know, which of those things, that's a, and that's a really wicked problem too, is gonna be a problem sooner. I would submit we're gonna have more problems with infrastructure issues since we are about to start the dredging and haven't started it yet sooner then that will become a problem. But you're right, eventually it will. What you were asking, that is a, a conundrum in regards to the Thimble Shoals deepening project. We're authorized for 55 right now, we're at 50, we we'll go down to 55, and also widen the channel to about 1,400 feet. So the post Panamax vessels that we're receiving now, ultra large container vessels, and also for the growing Navy fleet, we're able to have two way traffic without impediment. Now, you're correct, what you said. My view was sea level rise, well that's gonna be great for us because we have no overhead obstructions, it's just gonna give us more water to play with. But that does affect any shoaling or sediment deposits that we have. Now during Hurricane Sandy, when we were responding to the effects for the hurricane actually making landfall, uh, big thing from DHS was get the ports open, get the channels open. If you get the channels open, we're okay. That wasn't okay, because we did have the channels open. The problem was the infrastructure wasn't ready to receive vessels. They didn't have power. They didn't have sewage. All of those different. They didn't have gas. They exactly. They did not have gas. All of those different elements. So it's all you have to look at it as a multimodal, you know, connection. Everything is connected. Port of Virginia thrives right now for container vessels uh, because containers, you can get a box off at Virginia International Gateway and you can have it in Chicago in less than 24 hours because of the Heartland Corridor. 
Norfolk International Terminals is very dependent upon trucks. So all of those issues are very interdependent in regards to all of the commerce and people wanting to come into the area. We're trying to establish a deep water anchorage off of Cape Charles because the coal industry, which was definitely in a downturn years ago, is now very much in an upturn. And that's between Dominion Terminal Associations, Kinder Morgan, and Norfolk Southern. Kind of building on what uh, Mr. Ogle was saying, my predecessor who kind of threw me under the bus with this question. But uh, you know the answer. I know you know it the is answer. seemingly, because the Coast Guard has for, for decades that we've done with disaster response. And that this is very much what it sounds like we're in right now. But we're kind of ahead of the game. We're kind of responding to the disaster before it's a disaster. Now, one of the systems that we've used and utilized for years is NIMS, National Incident Management System. It's a unified command. It's that principle of bringing in all of the stakeholders who have an issue and putting them into one consolidated group and creating an incident action plan. Is that perhaps, maybe it's a simplistic thought for me who's just used to dealing with fire to fire to fire, but is this something that we need to do within the Commonwealth of Virginia? Is that first step is making sure we go ahead and identify the problem. I mean, everything that we've heard today and everything that we've heard leading up to this is that it's understanding that the amount the sea level is going to rise is a, kind of a, a Wagner, which is a wild ass gas, not easily refutable, meaning it's going to happen, but we don't know by how much. But the point is that we have to start responding to it now, and that's going to take a lot of plans and assessments and preparations to go beforehand. And for what you were saying, Admiral, is that we are not unified. Right now, we have independent actions, and it's almost a waste of energy. So is that perhaps one of the avenues that we look at is using something of a combined incident command structure to respond to this issue? If it, if it creates a structure by which we could assess as a region critical infrastructure as we define it in addition to the DHS definition that is vulnerable to sea level using challenging scenarios over time then that would be a value to us if it would if it would help us put together a structure that could do that that we must do that and until we do that we don't understand a lot of times people say to me well, what joint projects would we need to do? I don't know why we need to do a joint project. Well, the reason we don't know if we have any joint projects is because we haven't evaluated the whole region right. in that context. And until we do, we don't understand, oh my gosh, we aren't going to be able to get to Virginia Beach from Norfolk because of this, this, and this. Um, or uh, all of these buildings, will, foundations will be at risk because the groundwater level will rise to the point that they will be damaged and we will have to move X, Y, and Z. Uh, we haven't even looked at things like that yet. To a point, VDEM, uh, this is Stacy Neal for the Oh, sorry. Right, so Stacy Neal's work. Exactly. Which you were a part of. The, um, that was the port security grant. For the port, yeah. Correct, but that could but be a. In the security context. Correct, but especially, but it was identifying critical infrastructure, and it could be used, I would think, with a few tweaks of being able to say, I think that's part of the issue is that where are the experts who can give us that data set? that can make it relevant to people. I would say, in a very simple term, to be able to scare the, the daylights out of people. For, for example, my friend Kevin Oded, sector commander down in Houston, Galveston, he took command three uh, months before Harvey. He didn't get it. He said he saw all the flood maps, so okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. He doesn't get it, he did not get it until he was actually, he showed a picture, he does a presentation, he shows a street sign, and it's a picture of somebody taking a picture of a street sign, you know, like you would from the ground to your, angle is up. The next picture is somebody taking a picture of the same street sign from a flood punt, and it's a foot and a half underwater. And he goes, now I get it. I think that's what we need to do for the folks in Virginia without actually having to have them have take that picture as close as we can. And I think that's the sales pitch. Somebody give Andrea a microphone. She doesn't need one either. I would just add, I think many of us in Virginia are hopeful that perhaps the new special assistant position, because it is an advisor to the governor, could bring attention to this and try to have a coordinated effort and get into that regional mode versus the locality by locality reaction. And I would say the other thing is, um, occasionally I think terrifying people is the right answer. Um, <laughs> But often I don't think that. And the reason why is, first of all, if you go down that road here, you will be met with the full fire and fury of the real estate industry and the building industry in this region. So as soon as you start to go down that path, they go ballistic. These are the people who would not let the city of Chesapeake put 
hurricane evacuation zone stickers on street signs because they did not want anyone to know that they were in the hurricane evacuation zone at all. Now, um, in Norfolk, we just stuck them on garbage cans and nobody seemed to care. But um, so this, this is a, a big challenge for this region is dealing with the various commercial entities who make their living selling waterfront property or building waterfront property and are very reluctant to change. We are seeing some chinks in the armor. It is changing slowly uh, as people become more informed. So it really gets to the citizen engagement piece and you don't necessarily have to ter terrify them to get them to that point. But boy, if we could get them to buy flood insurance, that would sure be something. What Norfolk is what, 35% of the people in a special flood hazard area have flood insurance. These are the people in the 100 year floodplain. 35% of them actually have the flood insurance they're supposed to have. So how do you get that kind of education out to just you know helping people understand how to, and in addition to that problem, what can you do to your property to make it less costly flood insurance? Are there things you can do to not spend as much money um, when you actually have to get flood insurance, even those kinds of things are desperately needed here. And because um, I just, I sort of have a sense we're going to have enough terrifying stuff in our future. Um, and that's one of the things the cities worry about too, is they don't want to terrify people because they, again, they're afraid they'll, you know, they don't have a good answer. And, and I think I've had people say to me also, this is really interesting. Um, I know I should move um, or that I'm at risk, um, but I don't have I don't want to go alone. I have just two schools of thought. One is I can afford it, and so when I get to that point, I'll do it. One is I don't want to go alone. I want my friends and my neighbors to come with me. That's interesting. And then uh, another is um, I don't know what the process is. It's too hard to think about it, so I'll just stay where I am. So how do you kind of balance those three things with educating people about what their options are, incentivizing them to make that leap, even if they can't afford it, so that they have an opportunity uh, before it becomes a big problem over time and then see what are the phases for people who are of modest means, want to make a choice and don't want to be in an underwater situation with their mortgage, which people will begin to be in, where they are stuck and they can't get out. Okay, sorry, I'll stop talking. I just wanted to comment, so Norfolk undertook like something called, um, was it Plan Norfolk 2100? or Vision, Vision 2100, excuse me where we uh, worked with um, a variety of, of community input sessions, and we, we basically mapped out where our assets are in Norfolk and where we think we'll be in 2100, and, um, and then we published it, and then everybody went bonkers because they said, oh my God, you're not gonna invest in my neighborhood, what's gonna happen, you, what, you, you're leaving me high and dry, and that really wasn't the purpose of it, but it really did scare people a lot. People. But yep. you know, Norfolk realizes that we have to address this, and we have to be forward thinking, and we have this new, um, uh, zoning code that we've we've adopted, but it is scary, um, and it is it's it's that that challenge between um, identifying the risk and and still uh, people, keeping people calm enough that they're willing to get in the boat and row uh, together. Um, so that's number one. Number two is um, I I wanted to talk about an initiative that that happened about six seven years ago. Karen, you're here. Uh, the Virginia Coastal Coalition. Um, we actually tried to stand up, and we did for about a year. A 501c3 that was focused on uh, the business community and getting them um, uh, educated and starting to address um, flooding. We didn't even say sea level rise back then. We weren't allowed to say it then, just to give you an idea. Um, but So I think we need to think about standing that back up um, another time and maybe members in the audience here could, could help us with that as well. So, and uh, we're, we're getting there. And the, uh, the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission is also undertaking a project to uh, educate consumers on um, flood insurance right now. So that's going to be kicking off in the next six months or so. Right. right. I, I was about to say, we haven't really talked about JLU. So there's two, there's actually three joint land use studies underway. One of them's already, was already underway up in Hampton and it isn't only looking at sea level rise as the encroaching entity, but there are two underway. The first has, should complete later this year that looked at the Norfolk, Virginia Beach, down to Oceana, Dam Neck Corridor. Um, and the second will look at the close out the rest, well, a lot of the rest of the south side, Chesapeake up through Portsmouth, so it'll include Norfolk Naval Shipyard and Portsmouth Naval Medical Center and other facilities in Chesapeake um, and Portsmouth, looking at uh, with water as the encroaching entity. So the first, there is publicly available information on this work to date. AECOM is the prime. They've won the prime for the next uh, version also, which is good because they're doing excellent work. They've had one public meeting at the Planning District Commission. There is a website which you can get to through the Planning District Commission, which will show you the paper, the products that they briefed at the first public session, um, including maps, some really interesting 
um, analysis they've pulled together. And, and a lot of what they've done, some of it was out there, but it just wasn't all together in one place. So it's, it's really good work in that regard as well. Um, but the thing I find most fascinating is the transportation maps that show the zip codes where the highest volume of people live that drive every day to the, the federal facilities. And uh, there's a, a swath south from Little Creek through uh, Indian River through Virginia Beach. It runs right smack dab over Windsor Woods, which is one of the biggest flooding areas, Thalia Gardens, which is just south of uh, Virginia Beach Town Center, another big flooding area. And, um, and if that doesn't justify regional collaboration because all those people in that sector are going this way every day to all the different bases in the different cities. I don't know what does. So it's a terrific piece of work so far. And it will also give us, um, they've looked at, they've identified four critical areas just in their first study, which are really the area around Naval Station Norfolk and Norfolk, Norfolk International Terminal, Joint Base, Ex Expeditionary Base, Little Creek, Fort Story, which is shared fence line with Norfolk and Virginia Beach, which we looked at in the pilot project, um, the Lynn Haven River Inlet area, and then ton of the Dam Neck area, because the Dam Neck's very low. So um, those are their four key areas, and they'll be making recommendations for things that they think you know, would improve processes there. Um, Professor Andrews, I think we're going to have to leave it there. Right. Okay. But I want, um, before Heather Macera offers brief closing remarks, I have secured the chocolate cake for you to continue <laughs> your conversations when we do close at 2. Professor okay. Andrews, is there anything else you needed to no. say? Thank you all okay. very much. Heather? Thank you. Secure the chocolate.